All right, so the Biostar B360 GT5S might as well be one of the best $100 value options for your potential Intel 8th gen or 9th gen processor, and this is why. What's going on guys, my name is JD from JD Tech here and welcome back to the channel where we discuss PC patch reviews, guides, mods and more. So if you're into that sort of thing and you're new here, consider subscribing and checking out the rest of the channel to suit all your PC hardware needs. All right, so this is the Biostar B360 GT5S, which goes for about 100 bucks at MSRP. It supports Intel 8th gen and potentially 9th gen processors and at the $100 price point can be a very solid and valuable option for a budget to mid-tier system. So the thing I notice about this board right off the bat is that it doesn't come with a ton of accessories. I mean, you get three SATA connectors, the uh, manual and the driver CD and a uh, IO shield, which is pretty basic. So with all that combined, it kind of shows that the budget actually went more into the board than the accessories that came with it, which I do appreciate. Now let's see if that actually speaks on behalf of what we have here on the board. So the first part of this video, we're going to talk about the overview of the board, some of the features that I really like, and about some of the layout options that we have here, and also a little bit of the VRM. Then we'll go into the BIOS and see how that is and navigate through there to show you guys what it's like to make this as easy of a process for you to look back on and refer to in case you decide to buy this board and look back at this video for future reference. Okay, so some of the things I noticed right off the bat, we have a reinforced PCIe slot, which is nice to have. I have seen this on $100 boards before, so this is nothing too special, but it is nice to have. We also have dual M.2 slots over here, but the thing that's really nice about this is we have an M.2 heat spreader, which is really neat to see because I have seen this only on some very selective boards, but none that I have actually personally worked with, even up at the higher tier boards, like with some of the Z370 chipset boards. So this is really nice. If you're trying to purchase an M.2 heat spreader on its own, they usually run into around 15 to 20 bucks separately. So this is a nice inclusion. Now the nice thing about this board that I absolutely love and almost check on every single board that I purchase is a dual BIOS. So we have two BIOSes over here. We have ROM 1 and ROM 2. ROM 1 is the primary, ROM 2 is the backup BIOS. So what you do is you pretty much switch between the two BIOSes. It's set to the primary initially, but you can switch it to the backup in case you have a corrupt BIOS. Also, you can switch to that BIOS and update it individually from the other one when you want to switch it. Just remember to turn off your computer before switching that switch and switching to that other BIOS. So that already makes this a somewhat reliable board in the sense that you have some options and fail safes in case that something goes awry. And also another thing about the dual M.2 slots here is that this one runs at 32 gigabits per second, whereas this one runs at 16 gigabits per second. So if you're using an NVMe drive, you want to use it to its fullest potential and install it into this slot over here and not that one. All right, now let's just talk about some of the options that we have here on the board, like some of the headers and whatnot. So we have a total of three system fan headers. There's one over here and two over here and also a CPU fan header. Now there's no CPU optional fan header, but you can use the system one fan header as an alternative. It's not really gonna make a difference. They're all four pin headers, so it all reads the same in the BIOS. We also have two RGB headers over here, which are both 12 volt connections. Now I do like the inclusion of having two of these. Having one is usually pretty standard on most boards these days, but having two is pretty special. Now the only change I would have made is having a five volt header and a 12 volt header. Because there's two of them here, I would have liked to have seen a five volt header because that's the push in the RGB market these days to have addressable RGB LEDs. You can't have addressable LEDs with the 12 volt connection. So there is a difference. So that would have been nice to have seen and have that option. It's not a deal breaker, but it's just something worth noting. Another thing to notice is that the SATA ports are facing up rather than facing outwards to the side here. So I would recommend probably using those uh, L-shaped or 90 degree angle SATA connectors to maximize how you're using this board rather than having the straight connections coming up and over and around the board. So it would probably look a little bit tidier with those L-shaped or 90 degree angle SATA connectors. We have a USB 3.1 port over here, but there is no USB Type-C port, unfortunately, that's a internal header. We do have USB Type-C on the rear I.O., but nothing on the internal header, which is a little unfortunate to see because I would like to see that 
Uh, we're starting to see them on more PC enclosures now, so I would like to see that on more motherboards now. And for the audio over here, you'll see there's a very faint line going around the little audio components and modules. So this acts as a spacer or a shield that helps protect the audio clarity and quality from the rest of the board. Since the board is open, has all these open components, there will be some static interference, interfering with some of the modules and having that little shield over there will help reduce any of that and improve quality in your audio experience so that's nice to have uh, most of the boards do come with that these days but it's just something to make note of once again all right now let's talk about the vrm a little bit we have a pretty decent vrm over here there's no heat sink over here unfortunately there's only a heat sink over here and it's an okay heat sink uh this might get a little hot if you're trying to run an i7 or even some of those i5s like the 8600k in this board because uh, there's nothing here but the VRM is actually pretty decent now you can't just count the uh, chokes here these are called the chokes in case you guys are wondering and see how many phases you got on here to see what kind of power delivery we have now it's not gonna matter so much because we can't overclock on this board and you can't overclock on the RAM sticks either and that's also another thing worth mentioning this can only support up to 2866 megahertz RAM sticks the MOSFETs are actually pretty decent so I'm going to read off the stats off my phone here because I can't remember that off the top of my head. The low side MOSFETs over here use a SM4364 MOSFET, which is rated from minus 55 degrees Celsius to 150 degrees Celsius. So these things can run pretty hot and pretty reliable. I've seen some reviews and read some articles about them, and they're actually pretty decent MOSFETs. So these support 30 volts or 60 amps each. For the high side MOSFET, we have 30 volts or 50 amps each which is another well-made uh, MOSFET. And these are also rated from minus 55 to 150 degrees Celsius. So this will be pretty good at managing the power going to your CPU over here and also to the rest of the components on here. All right, now we're just gonna look at the rear IO pretty quickly. We have a DVI port and we also have an HDMI port, a no display port. We also have a USB type C port over here, which is nice to see. This is a 3.1 Gen 2, I believe. And then we have some regular USB 3.0 ports and uh, some 3.1 ports over here, a PS2 connector and your audio output. Nothing too fancy or too crazy, but uh, pretty run of the mill and pretty standard. Will be good for any sort of budget or mid-tier build. No problem there. And overall, I do like the color scheme of this board. Now I know motherboards are not really supposed to be meant for aesthetics, but they have been over the last couple of uh, years. I could say they've actually progressed a lot in the aesthetics department. And I could say this is a good looking board. It's very clean. It's just gray and black and a good looking aesthetic overall, nothing too flashy or crazy. And I actually do like it a lot. So now we're gonna put some components in here and we're gonna test out and see what the BIOS is like how to update the BIOS and what kind of features it offers and how easy it is to use. So when you load up the BIOS, you can press F9 to load into your boot options when going into the BIOS, or you can press delete to enter into the BIOS, or you can press F12 to enter the BioFlash utility. So that's pretty easy and simple to do. Now I'm just gonna show you guys around the BIOS, which is pretty easy. So all your advanced functionality is obviously gonna be under the advanced tab, but there's not much you can do in terms of overclocking for memory or your CPU. So even if we go down to CPU configuration, sorry, the keyboard's kind of loud. You can see that we have overclocking lock over here and you can enable it or disable it. An overclocking lock, I'm not, 100% sure on, but you cannot overclock in a B360 board. Uh, you have all your SATA configurations over here. We can see that we have one SATA port enabled right here, and that's being used by the 120 gigabyte SSD that I have in. Hardware monitor just pretty much shows the stats of your components, which is always available on pretty much any motherboard that you go on. So you have your chipset information over here, which usually most people don't even mess with. Then you have your boot priorities over here, and your boot options. If you want your boot option priorities, they would be listed or highlighted up over there. And ONE is an overclocking utility. Like I was explaining before, this board does not overclock, but will perhaps allow you to reach the targeting frequency of the max turbo on your processor. And you can also enable your XMP profile from here. So the XMP profile is for your memory 
modules. So what that does is pretty much enable the listed frequency of your memory modules to whatever the board supports, which is 2866. The RAM that I'm using right now goes up to 3000 megahertz. So the XMP profile would only go up to 2866 on that. And you can control voltage configurations for your RAM and CPU from here as well. And if you want to go into your fan configuration, you just hit F5. And you can look at your different system fans over here. You have your CPU, system one, system two, and system three, all your different fans, and what kind of fan curve you want. And sometimes you want manual, you can adjust them. If you want aggressive, you can do that or quiet, that would dip them below. So those are all your different options. And if you want to change the LEDs, including the RGB headers on the board, you press F6 and you enter into the RGB utility on here. Basically, this lets you have pretty much basic control over the RGB LEDs. You can further that with some software but this is pretty basic this pretty much allows you to control the brightness of the led strip on the board yes the board does have an led strip and also the color of the led strip nothing too crazy pretty simple you can see the clock speed for both the cpu and the memory right here the temperature and the date and time which you can also set from the main tab so pretty easy pretty simple and overall a pleasurable experience even though you can't overclock does allow you to have some sort of flexibility in that regard. All right, so the Biostar B360 GT5S is one of the best $100 options in my opinion. If you're trying to find a Z370 board for $100, you are stripping a lot of features off the board and you're gonna to have to start paying around $130 to get some of those features back. Now, if you're not interested in overclocking whatsoever, I think this is one of the best mid-tier or budget-oriented boards that you can possibly get for $100. You get a good amount of value and options on this motherboard to suit a bunch of your different needs. And the only thing that's kind of unfortunate with it is that there's no USB Type-C internal header, there's no RGB 5 volt header, the rear I.O. is a little lackluster and the LED strip over here is all bare LEDs and there's no diffusion. Granted, you can just turn it off in the BIOS or in the software provided with the driver. So that's not really too much of an issue. Overall, this board uses very good modules throughout the board and also has a decent VRM and also has some extra features like the M.2 cooling heatsink. But either way, the board is very reliable and you also have a dual BIOS, which is really nice to have and is something I recommend, especially for beginners with building a PC in case your BIOS gets corrupt and you have something else you can fall back on that I explained earlier in the video. So with the value that this board offers, I'm going to give it the value cog, which means it offers superior value and durability in its price tier or at least one of the top contenders so if you're interested in purchasing this board or checking it out there will be a link in the description below and if you're still on the edge about it there's a motherboard review right over here as well as some other pc hardware reviews for your next upgrade or pc build and if you guys want to help support the channel and the work that i put into these videos there is a link to my patreon down in the description below as well as some merchandise on my store like this shirt over here or some pc art like that over there to make your setup nice and spiffy so thank you all for watching if you're new here consider subscribing and i'll catch you in the next one